Hey, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining me in my uh, shop for Shop Talk. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think I got a pretty interesting topic tonight. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how heat transfers with different type of uh, heat emitters and stuff like that. So I think uh, it'll be pretty interesting. I didn't have a really clever demo to do with it, live demo. So I did like kind of a little uh, a tool tip demo. I did some stuff over on my vice here that we'll do a little uh, video towards the end and then uh, see how that goes. But I got a nice plan for the next one. I'm on the back side of my display here. I've got some new stuff that I'm building. So, all right, let's go through a little a bit of housekeeping and we'll get going. Hi, some friends in there. Hi, Mark and, and Jay, a couple people I know there. So, um, yeah, so this is what we've done so far. We can, uh, we have these archived if you want to go and uh, watch or rewatch one of the, the previous ones. And then we also picked up uh, three topics for the next. We'll go to the end of the May, see how it goes and uh, see what kind and of crowd. Bob, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, we need to see your screen. If you could share that, that would be terrific. Oh, I'm sorry about that, folks. Uh, where is that? Show my screen. All right, is that better, Mary? Voila. Yep. And then if you can just put her in presenter mode, we got it. Yep. Thank right. you. Sorry about that, folks. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, <clears throat> some uh, housekeeping stuff here. You know, if you have problems with the uh, GoToWebinar breaking down or something like that, that's a tech support number that they can uh, help you with a connection issue. You know, if the sound gets weird, or the um, you know the videos aren't lining up or something like that. Sometimes if you just sign out and sign back in, you get a better connection. That's what we found when uh, that happens to us is we just start over and that usually cleans it up. So, um, and those again are the, the chop talk issues that we've done already. So we talked about air and we talked about uh, uh, dirt separation, magnetic separation, and then uh, I'll show you what's coming up next. So <clears throat> Tonight we're going to talk about transferring heat, and then I'm going to do hydraulic separation. That kind of ties in with the primary second that we did uh, last week. So it's, I think, kind of the next uh, evolution in the way we pipe systems. So uh, that's a product that we know, I know a lot about working with Calepi for the last, uh, whatever, 12 years, whatever it's been now. So I've got some good information about um, how they work and why you might want to use one and, uh, and pros and cons. I'll tell you the good and bad news about them. Not every job needs a hydraulic separation, and so we'll dive into that a little bit. And I've got a good... Um, a demo. I don't know if you can see behind me. You can see the dog behind me, but I got a. I built a clear um, hydro separator, a four-port uh, hydraulic separator, so you can see exactly what goes on in there, how the flows kind of bypass, and it also uh, does dirt and magnetic separation. So you can see all four of those functions when I when I run it on the display here behind me. So that's going to be a fun one. And then uh, yeah, last week's donation, we had a bunch of people tell us that they sent some uh, <clears throat> some food down to the food banks, and we did also. So thanks everybody that that supported us in that uh, in that charity and then we've got a choice for this week and there's uh, uh john messenbring mechanical hub uh, today did you go by or something john took some canned goods down to his uh his local food pantry so thanks for doing that yeah we weren't quite six feet apart but you're leaning out there a little bit john so that counts <laughs> well that's nice there it's got one of the mechanical contractors on the truck too perfect and so for this week's uh, donation, we thought we would go with Meals on Wheels. You know, they do a lot of good out there, and there's certainly a lot of people. My mother's one of those. Mother-in-law is one of those. It's kind of closed in right now, not wanting to <laughs> leave the door. So it's nice to have people like that that can uh, deliver meals and keep an eye on some of the elderly folks out there. So thanks for uh, supporting that for us. All right, so here we go. Um, a lot of what I'll be talking about tonight comes out of issue number 23, hydronics issue that we did. Uh, we did an issue just, you know, heat transfer and hydronic systems, and probably most of the slides that I'll be using come out of there. So uh, hopefully everybody's getting these hydronics mailed to you. You know, twice a year we send these out for free. We'll mail them to your, your home or to your uh, business, wherever you want them to arrive and also they're available on our website as a PDF. And there's a lot of good information on there. You know, we, we try and keep it as generic as possible. You know, it's not always about cluffy stuff. You'll see our competitor's product in there. It's just really a good, uh, we try to like to call it a technical journal is really what it is. So, um, and if you want the back issues, let us know. We have some of those available still too. And one other thing I would ask, if there's a topic you think that we should be talking about that we uh, haven't already or that we should talk about again, maybe, uh, let us know because we're, we're always looking for new things to talk about that can help the industry in general. It doesn't have to be about you know, um, cluffy products. In fact, the next one's going to be on uh, air to water heat pumps, which is getting to be a pretty hot topic out there. So we're going to try and 
uh, you know, talk about that a little bit. And, then, you know, the heavy lifting goes to John Sigenthaler, does most of the work. I'd like to take credit for these, but a lot of my pictures show up in them. And, you know, Siggy will come up with an idea or concept and send it to me. And then I go back in the shop here and build it up and see how it works and try it out. So some of the uh, homemade looking pictures in those are probably from my shop. But, uh, you know, John does most of the uh, the calculations and the, and the heavy lifting on those. So I don't know if he's on board today, but thanks for that, Siggy. All right, so hey, we're going to do this for our giveaway. Um, we're going to have some of these Shop Talk uh, t-shirts made, and we found a company that prints on demand, which is nice uh, for a couple reasons. Is number one, you don't have to buy a case of them to get you know all the different sizes, and there's a couple different selections of shirts and stuff on that, so we can get the uh, you know get the size that you need and want, and we can get them printed one at a time or ten or twenty, whatever it takes. So. I'm going to do the uh, trivia, I guess, question right on the front end here. This one's going to be a little tougher on the uh, the lyrics from a song. And I want you you got to know the uh, the name of the song and the artist on this one. So two things to win the uh, the T-shirt there. So the lyric goes like this. It goes, uh, more bills than cash. I can do the math. Trying to stay focused on the righteous path. That's the lyric. So I can repeat it if, uh, if everybody didn't hear that. It didn't come through clear. So uh, more bills than cash. I can do the math. Trying to stay focused on the righteous path. And I've been in that boat for, for a long time when I started out. More bills than cash. Probably we've all been there at one point. Excuse me. So over there on the left, this is what we're going to try and get through tonight in the time that we have. Like I say, we'll go, I don't know, maybe 45 minutes here. Then we'll do the little demo a video. Then I'll come back for any questions and stuff. But uh, I won't read through all those. But they're all different ways that we transfer heat. You know, first from the boiler into the fluid stream and then from the fluid stream into the uh, different types of emitters. So I'm going to go through, you know, the most common emitters that we see out there, radiant slabs and stuff like that. But what also what I want to do is I want to start out and just clear up a couple of things I didn't have maybe the best answer for last week. So the couple of slides here just answering some of the questions that came uh, that were typed in as we were going last week. And it had to do with uh, uh, pumps and piping on pumps specifically, you know, what to do and what not to do. Uh, the question I think was how many uh, uh, inches or feet of straight pipe upstream of the pump. And so there's our suggestion, 12 pipe diameters upstream. So if it's one inch pipe, you know, a foot, two inch, 24 inches. And that just makes sure that the, the flow kind of straightens out before it gets into the uh, inlet side of the circulator. And the other things that we always want to avoid with any circulator is we don't want to put a real flow restrictive device on the suction side of it. Certainly a Y strainer, which we know plug up after time, and now you're going to starve that uh, that circulator for flow. So um, if there's a Y strainer, ideally a dirt separator, somewhere in the system, you know, put it maybe on the inlet side of the boiler so it protect the boiler and the circulator. But again, we'd want at least 12 inches of you know pipe between uh, any of these devices if you got a, a check valve or anything like that. And the other thing I wanted to show down here. On the check valve, I'd like to see that the same thing about 12 pipe diameters away. Now, I understand that a lot of circulators have check valves built right into them now, so it's not an ideal place to put a check valve, but again, maybe it's the lesser of two evils. If people weren't using check valves at all, it certainly is nice to have a check you know, built right into the circulator, but ideally, it would be a little distance away from it. And if you do uh, buy a check valve that you're going to put on the discharge like that, you want to get a hydronic specific check valve, not a swing check valve. Get something that's got a uh, spring loaded check in it and also a conical shape to it. So it's got a nice flow passage to it so it doesn't uh, make noise and vibrate and uh, clatter around in there. So uh, we make a check valve like that. Other people do too. Watts, Combraco make um, hydronic specific check valves if you want to put one in the system. I like them a little bit better than flow checks. You know, the old weighted style flow check just seems like a lot of uh, iron, a lot of technology to do a simple thing, which is a half a pound of weight that the uh, circulator opens up or pops open when it, when it starts. So, and then the last thing, and we'll talk about this when I do an expansion tank specific uh, session, it's going to be on the point of no pressure change and expansion tank. So we'll get into that a little bit more why the uh, tank doesn't want to be on the discharge side of the circulator there. So that'll be a whole nother shop talk. Now, Bob, I know that circulator best practices are of the key most uh, importance, but we have some answers to your trivia question. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, Steve Martino, could the answer be the righteous path? drive-by truckers. Yes, it is. I thought that was going to be a pretty obscure one for somebody that I thought that they had to put their thinking cap on, unless he Googled it, but uh, that's it, and he's the winner, and we'll get you uh, get a prize to you. Yep. Ding, somebody ding, ding. <laughs> Go ahead, Mary. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you for all who um, submitted and I think you may have stumped folks uh, initially, but then then they got they caught on. So very good. Yeah. Thank you. We were, we were chatting a little bit before we started and I nobody in my team knew the lyrics there and they said, well, where'd you come up with that? And, you know, I listen to Sirius when I, well, I haven't been on the road much lately, but when I'm driving and I just kind of switch between all these different genres and hear these songs that I've never heard before, which is kind of interesting and helps the uh, the drive time go by. And I just heard that. I thought it was a clever song. All the lyrics are clever in it, but uh, yeah. So good. download that. Drive by Truckers, uh, Righteous Path is the name of the song. Now, the other thing that we talked about a little bit last week, and it's going to apply to what we're talking about tonight, is how flow goes through a, a pipe or through a tube. And there's a couple different conditions that the, the flow can be in as it goes through a tube, and it can be either a laminar or turbulent flow. So laminar flow, if you'd looked at it, if you could explode the view there, it would look something like this, where the water goes through kind of in just little cones like that. And it doesn't transfer heat very well because you get, well, you can read, read right up here, you get this little boundary layer along the outside wall of the tubing. So the heat that's within that water, glycol, whatever the fluid might be that's going through there isn't in good contact with the surface of the pipe or your radiator or your heat emitter whatever it might be so if we're trying to move heat energy out of a fluid stream into a heat emitter into a pipe into a radiant slab whatever it might be we'd like to have this condition here where all that temperature is contacting the edges of the um or contacting the wall of the pipe or the uh you know, the wall, the panel radiator, cast iron radiator, whatever it might be. So we can predict when this happens in a tube, if we know the size of the tube and we know a couple of pieces of information, and I'll show you how we do that. But uh, one of the questions that came up, and I'll go back a slide here. Um, when using the old style air purgers, you know, the scoop or the ramp type air purgers, you know, I heard somebody say, well, you want that 18 or 24 inches upstream of that so the flow can go laminar. Well, that's not exactly what happens there. The only way the flow can go laminar, if you slow it way down, I mean way down, below a foot per second velocity. So really with that straight section in front of the, uh, take them down here, I've got a cutaway of a scoop type purger, that straight section upstream of this is really intended to, uh, um, have the bubbles rise up to the top of the fluid stream before it even gets into the air purger so it's got a better chance of getting out we're not turning the flow into laminar condition as it comes into that we're just getting the bubbles up to the uh, top so we can uh, a vacuum on them a vacuum evacuate them out of the uh, purger a little bit easier a little bit quicker so now i got a mess on my computer uh, all right so one way that we know and predict the um uh, what the flow condition is going to uh, going to be through a tubing is this thing called a Reynolds number and so it's really a dimensionless value that just tells the condition inside a pipe and so what they say is anything below 2000 would be laminar flow anything with, that's got a Reynolds number above 4000 would be turbulent now notice there's a little gap in here and that gap is what they call the critical zone and that's where the flow is in, is it's in transition and it's hard to predict if it's laminar or it's turbulent so there's a little bit of space and I'll show you on a, a calculator next of where that falls when you put a pipe size in you put a flow rate in it it's going to predict uh, what condition you're under now there's the math for it if you wanted to do the math and figure that out if you knew some some of the dimensions and some of the fluid and stuff in it you could calculate it longhand like that but uh, there's calculators online that you just plug in a couple of pieces of information and it spits that number out for you because again everything that we do in hydraulics we want to be under this condition if we're trying to transfer heat now there is one um, one condition where we might not want to go to turbulent flow conditions and think about this if you have a um, Oh, take a district system, for example. We've got a central uh, boiler plant, and maybe the pipe is going underground to all these different buildings. Well, we don't want to lose a lot of heat through that underground insulated piping, so an engineer might design that so it's working under laminar flow, a real slow flow condition under probably a foot per second velocity, depending on the pipe size, so that he gets most of the heat from the, you know, from the heat of uh, generator from the boiler room out to the buildings before it gets lost to the ground. So there are conditions where an engineer might look at laminar flow and decide uh, his pipe sizing and his pumping flow rates to stay under that condition. But once it gets to the building, once it gets to the heat emitters, we need to have this turbulent condition so we can exchange that heat out of the fluid stream as best we can. 
And by the way, it's happening as we speak in our bodies. I, as I was searching for, uh, you know, Reynolds numbers and turbulent flow, this came up. Who knew? I didn't know. But uh, the same thing would happen, you know, in our body. We want this type of flow condition. And if your veins or your vessels start to uh, uh, plaque up or you start to get, the, you know, a little bit of scale build up inside your veins, this is what happens. You get that little choke down section, just like when we have a balancing valve where we choke the flow down. And now we're going to have a little turbulent condition on the other side of that. And probably want to go to the doctor if they think that's happening and what they'll do is they'll put a uh, you know stethoscope and they'll go around and they can detect that uh, going on just by hearing that uh, you know that condition that you get when you get turbulent flow or when you restrict uh, water or blood in this case through a, uh, a restriction like that and that's you can see how the flow changes from turbulent to uh, from laminar to turbulent conditions because of that restriction and that down downstream uh, turbulent condition. All right, so this, I think I showed this on the, one of the other ones, and I, I kind of like this, uh, the Plastic Pipe Institute has this free calculator on their website. Uh, you have to agree to some terms to use it, but basically, uh, this one's just for plastic pipe, of course, because that's the business they're in, but you just put the type of tubing in here. They've got PVC, they've got a bunch of different plastic tubes, and the um, the wall thickness of the tube down here, PEX is the SDR, uh, standard dimensional ratio of nine, uh, the size of the tube, and then you can put in a, um, a flow rate and it's going to um, predict one of these boxes over here. So in this case, I just kept uh, going down with my flow rate, going down, going down, going down until I could get the flow in that three quarter pecs down to a, a laminar condition. And over here is kind of what I did. So to get down to laminar flow condition, I had to get down to 0.4 tenths under a half a gallon a minute flow rate to get down to a laminar flow condition in a three quarter uh, pecs. And at that flow rate, we're looking at a 0.4 feet per second. Think of a you know, water going through a pipe, you know, how many feet per second, you know, a half a foot per second, barely going to see that movement at that kind of flow rate. So then I just kept playing with this formula and just putting different uh, a GPN numbers to see where it uh, went into transitional flow. So there you can see a point where I went into transitional flow. And then I wanted to see where I got up in the turbulent condition. So somewhere about 0.5, just over half a gallon per minute, I got up into this condition here, which would be good for transfer and heat you know, out of that pipe into uh, whatever it might be, a slab or into a, a, a heat emitter of some sort. So um, most of the other piping materials out there, whether it's copper pipe, you can find a chart like this online. You can find one for, um, you know, steel pipe, Schedule 40, Schedule 80. One of the best resources I've found for um, uh, looking at other pipes is it's called the Engineering Toolbox. It's just a website that has all sorts of different calculators. And if you put in a uh, flow velocity uh, calculator, it will come up and you can... Uh, you know, input the type of pipe you have, the flow rate, the size of the pipe, the type of fluid, the temperature. I mean, you can really nail it down to a tight number. So uh, this is a, you know, we have those charts that are just kind of rules of thumb saying the maximum amount of flow that you could put in an inch and a quarter co uh, pipe, copper pipe, whatever it might be. But this would be a, 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 you know, something you want to use if you really want to get that number exact, where you don't have to guess and say, well, do I have to go from inch and a quarter to inch and a half? What would happen to my flow velocity if I went 13 gallons a minute through inch and a quarter instead of the recommended 10 gallons per minute? So this, you know, all these tools are out there. They're available for free for the most part. So you know, take advantage of them. So here's what we know. The second law of thermodynamics basically simply says, you know, heat energy transfers from a material at a given temperature to another material at a lower temperature. So hot goes to cold always. We can't make things cold. So if you put a six pack of warm beer in your refrigerator, what the refrigerator does, it pulls the heat out of that six pack and expels it to the outside of the refrigerator, either coil on the bottom or the coil on the back. If you put your hand on that, heat comes off of that. Well, that's the heat that it's pulling out of that uh, that warm six pack that you just put in the refrigerator. So heat goes to uh, cold and uh, we know that uh, with buildings, obviously, <clears throat> because the windows, you know, the heat's gonna try and go through all the low R values to the outside. And the rate of that heat transfer, how quickly that happens or how quickly I can recover, say an indirect tank, uh, depends on the, the delta T, the temperature difference between them. So in this little example here, the hotter the temperature and the colder the temperature on the other side, the faster the transfer is gonna be. So when we look at moving heat, we look at running at different delta Ts. And if we can run at a, a wide delta T, we can move a lot of heat. And I'll give you some examples of a um, type of system that we run at wide delta Ts or narrow delta Ts. Why would you choose one or the other? What's the pros and cons of that? So uh, same thing here. We look at heat. Uh, we can uh, transfer heat three different ways, and we do in hydronic systems. 
we can do um, conduction where if I put my hands around that coffee cup, I would feel the temperature coming out of the ceramic or whatever that cup is made out. That's called conduction. Convection is what we do with a fin tube baseboard where warm, uh, cold air comes into the bottom, the pipe and the fins are warm, so it, it gets this little convection current going, warm air comes out the top, so you got cold going in, warm coming out. I could take a convection a step further and put a fan on it, then I've got forced convection. And then the last one, my favorite, is radiation. And when I'm talking about radiation, we're talking about light, basically. You know, uh, radiant heat travels as a light. It's a light that we can't see. It's a that spectrum that you can't see that moving. But that's how that energy transfers. And what's nice about that, it transfers in any direction. Uh, so I could have heat up on my ceiling. I could have a radiant ceiling. I would feel it down here. My walls could be radiant. As long as I have a visual, a line of sight to that, um, that heat will transfer to from the warmer object to the colder object. And that's basically how the sun works. If you walk outside on a cold winter day and you're back in the shadow and you walk out into the sun and put your face towards the sun, immediately within seconds you'll feel that radiant energy from the sun that's what, 93 million miles away, whatever it is, it travels through space that quickly and as soon as it sees something uh, that it can strike, you feel that uh, heat energy being transferred and that's, uh, that's how we do it with radiant surfaces, whether they're floors or walls or ceilings. So. What we know also that the heat output is fairly proportional be, to, uh, to the difference between the supply water temperature, the temperature, the, the, the wall, the heat emitter, whatever it might be, and the room air temperature. It's a pretty linear uh, thing. And, and that's why when we use an outdoor reset control on a boiler, you know, the two follow themselves pretty closely. We step up or down the temperature going to the uh, house as the temperature outside or inside, you know, the building changes. So it's a pretty linear relationship to move heat uh, based on the temperature difference. So. Um, and so that delta T that the circuit's operating under is related to the ability of that heat emitter to give off heat. So if I have a wide delta T, I can move a lot of heat. If I have a narrow delta T, I'm moving a little bit less heat. So we'll show you some examples of that. And so when you go to design a system, you say, well, uh, what's a delta T I should shoot for? What's my target? What's the number? And you know, we've used this number 20 for years. I don't know where it came from. It just makes the math easy. Maybe that was the simplest thing. But it basically, um, it doesn't have to be that, and the system doesn't have to stay at that 20 degree delta T, uh, of course, you know, from the turn on to the turn off point. It can vary a little bit, and it will vary based as the load in the building, as the load changes against that heat emitter, the delta T will always move. So if you put a bucket in front of your boiler and just put two temperature probes on that and just sat there for an hour, turned it on when a cold house is cold, watch a delta T, it might be 25, 30, even with a 20 degree design until that fluid temperature starts warming up. As a room where the load starts catching up, you'll see the delta P will close down until it gets to zero, which means the thermostat's turned off and there's no heat transfer obviously going on when it's a zero delta T. So these are typical numbers. Again, you could jump around anywhere within this range. For a radiant slab, we try and keep that delta T fairly tight so the consistent uh, temperature across the floor, if we walk from one end of the zone to the other end of the zone or the loop, it feels about the same temperature. So we want to keep usually a 10 to 15 degree delta T. Now that doesn't mean it won't go lower than that or it won't go wider than that. Fin tube, you know, 20 seems to be the number there. You know, we can keep it at that. It could be 25, it could be 15. Uh, panel radiators, we can go a little bit wider, you know, 30 to 40 uh, degree delta T is a fairly common design uh, for a panel radiator because we've got a lot of surface area that we can work with there. And if you think about it, if we do a sim here, a snow and ice melt, we can move a lot of BTUs per square foot, um, 150, 200, even more, because why would that why would that be? Why can we move so much more out of a square foot of concrete in a snow melt compared to inside the building? Well, the delta T. I mean, if you look outside and it's 30 degrees outside, the ambient air temperature around that slab is 30 degrees. If I'm supplying it with 100 degree water, I got a huge delta T to work with so I can get a lot of B2 output out of a square foot of concrete if it's sitting outside where that wide delta T is driving that heat transfer. So, uh, and these, I just got this picture today, thanks to Mark Etherton for turning me on to uh, this picture of a really nicely made radiator. So really anything that you can, uh, get warmer than the ambient air temperature around it can be a radiator it could be a wall it could be a stair railing like this it could be pretty much anything in fact i've done a a couple of radiators over my lifetime just trying different materials to see what would happen and this is a in fact i still have this it's a concrete dog that i uh, had one of those uh, ornamental concrete companies cast this 
And I took some uh, corrugated stainless steel tubing to the guy and I said, you know, when you mold this up, it's a rubber mold that they uh, put some rebar in. I said, can you put some tubing in there? So it goes up the rear leg of this dog and it winds around a, a rib cage in here, a rebar, and it comes down the other front leg here. And you can see the connections on the back there. So put 100 degree water into it and that's what you get right there. You get a, a cast a concrete, cast concrete <laughs> dog radiator. And we used to put our clothes and stuff on it just to keep it warm. So. When you get out of the shower, you get up in the morning, you've got uh, a clothes warmer, like a towel bar, but it's a dog. And we had a new puppy one time. He goes in there and starts barking at it. He didn't realize it was made out of concrete. Looks like a foxhound. All right, so here's the heat output graph. So let's start, a, we'll put some numbers on this. I'm not gonna do a lot of math and a lot of formulas. I like doing the visuals, but it, it's important to know the math behind uh, all these pictures and these visuals. So let's just uh, you know, design a system. Let's say we've got 100,000 BT load and we're gonna flow through this uh, loop. Let's call it a thin tube loop. It could be a cast iron radiator. It doesn't matter what the heat emitter is. And we're gonna supply that with 180 degrees and it's in a room with the air temperature, say 70 degrees. So a design condition, I designed this, so I've got about a 20, it came out to 22.9 degree delta T is at my design condition. So that's, uh, you know, I'm just turning the thermostat on for the first time, the house is starting to come up to heat, I've got this kind of delta T. And so what's gonna happen is I start catching up with my heating load. <clears throat> Down here as my heating load starts uh, being covered or catching up, you can see the delta T is gonna close, 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 and it's gonna get smaller and smaller and until it gets down to zero when the heat load is covered. So this is a normal operating condition for a hydronic system where we're maintaining a constant flow rate. I'm not varying the flow rate through this and I'm supplying it with a certain temperature and that delta T is gonna close up as the heat load goes away. And so think of that um, fin tube heat emitter. And so the air coming in starts out at say 60 degrees. I've got my design condition as it warms up and warms up. Now I've got less delta T between the air temperature and that uh, temperature of the fin at say 170 degrees, whatever it might be. My delta T starts closing up. Eventually my thermostat satisfies and it shuts off. So it's really the thermostat that's in charge of what's going on in there. But this is what would happen if you just sat there and measured the delta T uh, going out to that, um, that circuit and coming back, you would see that it would shrink as we get closer and closer to the load. Now, what we can do nowadays, which makes this even nicer, is we can put a, a boiler in there that can modulate with that load also, so we don't have to have a fixed uh, temperature supply, and that's pretty nice. That's a good way to modulate the temperature to a load that changes. As you can see down here, as, the, as it gets warmer outside or whatever, causes the load to change, warmer in the building, you're doing some cooking, whatever. It'd be nice to modulate that burner down and always match that load instead of shutting off, shutting on, shutting off, shutting on. And if we do that with temperature instead of flow rate, I can get a nice stable uh, parallel curve, I guess you would call it, by modulating that temperature. And I'll show you in this uh, example here. So when you design a fin tube system, this is a, uh, John Sigenthaler sells this little simulator software here. It's really nice. It's got a bunch of different toolbars across the top. So I can do a heat load, a baseboard fin tube. I can do a circuit simulator. simulator. I can size expansion tanks. I can correct for different uh, percentages of, of glycol, um, <clears throat> insulation factor on pipes, how that changes the heat loss, um, some fuel cost comparison. This one's really handy too. It's a buffer tank sizer. So I can pick a certain size of tank, put an operating condition on that tank, and it'll, it'll tell me what my run time, my boiler on and off time would be. So, so this is the baseboard simulator. And so what you do here is I can pick a pump. I, I think I put a Taco 007 in here. I put a, a supply temperature of 180 degrees going out to this, just a small fin tube circuit. I don't know, about a 20,000 B2 load. And so I can go in there and I can define, there's a pull down menu, I can put slant fin in there, embassy, whatever type of baseboard you want, different sizes of baseboard, uh, different models of it. And then I put the load in up here. So if I had, I don't know if I put in this great room, I think I might've hit a 10,000 B2 load in there. It'll tell me the uh, length of baseboard I need to cover that load in that room under this condition. What I like about this is every time you go to the next room, since I'm in a series here, it's going to tell me what the available temperature is at that next baseboard. So what I did on these bedrooms here is I put the same load on every bedroom. I call them the guest bedrooms or the kids' bedrooms. And you can see that the length of the fin tube starts to get longer and longer as I go around the circuit because my temperature is dropping. Even though I had the same BTU per hour load in every room, 
every time I go through a heat emitter, I drop some temperature, drop some temperature. So instead of using the supply water temperature to size baseboard or using the average water temperature, if I said, well, if I start with 180 and I come back at 170, um, you know, my average temperature is those heat emitters and size it by that, this is going to get it even a little bit more accurately because it's going to size every baseboard to the exact load in that room at the condition of a, or at the temperature that it's receiving as it goes through there. So there's an example where I can put a room name in there. I can put the type of fin tube I wanted to put in there, put my design load and put that in. And then once I accept that, this is what you end up with. <clears throat> so it shows me all the different uh, lengths and all those different rooms as I go through the loop here. And I can play around with that. I could pick a different circulator pump. I could go a bigger pump. I could go a smaller pump. I could change my supply water temperature. Uh, if I wanted to put a percentage of glycol in here, I could see how that affects the heat output going through here. So it allows you to play all these what if scenarios before you even go and you know, pick up the parts to build a job like that. I can say, well, no sense in putting you know, the same amount of baseboard in every one of these rooms. You can see right here, my first room is six feet. I had to go a little bit longer in the next room because I dropped that temperature from there to there this baseboard is seeing a lower temperature. So it's just a, um, it's an accurate way to do a design and it's, uh, you know, you can play around with it. So let's say I've got what, six uh, fin tubes on that, probably don't want to go much more than about 60, 65 feet on a series zone like that. I can just go down here and put another zone in it and it would just split off another zone and I could do maybe the upstairs or the basement as a separate zone. And the same thing, I could toggle on different circulators, different operating conditions and just see what the result is, how much heat I'm gonna move, uh, what my temperature drop is through that circuit, all that stuff. So if you're doing this type of design work, this is a pretty handy little uh, calculator to give all the information to you. All right, so now there's another uh, condition that's going on out there in uh, <clears throat> some of the pumping uh, options that are available to, today. There's a, there's a delta T and a delta P pump. And what the delta T uh, pump does, it tries to keep a set uh, temperature going through the heat emitters all the time. So let's say you designed a system at a 20 degree delta T. The circulator is going to speed up or slow down trying to maintain that uh, temperature all the way from start up to sh uh, a shut off. And basically, if you think about it, what it's doing, it's really uh, kind of like an injection mixing where it's just pulsing that heat in there. You know, it's just trying to match the load by changing that uh, speed of that pump. Here's one thing I want you to be aware of when you do that. So this line up here is what would happen if it was just allowed on a reset control to just operate at fixed speed on the circulator. This orange line, if you look what happens here, is the flow rate's changing on this orange line, and it's changing because the flow rate's trying to match that delta T that you programmed into that circulator pump. And so you're fine. I mean, that's good as long as you know that when you start getting down to these low supply temperatures where your boiler's ramping down on its outdoor reset and the circulator's still trying to maintain that 20 degree delta T, you can see that your output's going to drop off pretty quickly. In fact, when you get down to this point right here, you've got about 50% less output by modulating that uh, that speed, that flow rate down, as opposed to just letting the temperature go down in that loop. So just beware of that. Know that when you get down to the low end of that, you might get to a point where you're not going to cover the load anymore. You don't have enough flow going through that pipe to get the heat that you need uh, to offset the, uh, the load, let's say 4,000 beats your load there. So and that's all knowable information. You know, you can put that in the previous slide I just showed you. If you had that simulator, you could put that in there and see what that condition would be if you kept that flow rate. So the other thing is um, when you try and regulate a heat output by varying the flow rate, it's a very nonlinear thing. As you can see how these curves or these two lines, these slopes, let's call them, they start to uh, split apart. We're in the previous drawing. They paralleled each other. And that's why the outdoor reset can almost perfectly match the heat loss of a building because the, you know, it's uh, the temperature is pretty closely related, you know, the amount of temperature you have to increase as the load on the building increases and vice versa is a, a fairly consistent parallel curve. So it makes it pretty predictable and pretty easy to dial in a boiler with an outdoor reset. You know, it might take a couple of trips back to get that number, but you should be able to modulate that boiler pretty much from a design day down to whatever the lowest turndown rate is and exactly match the loss of the uh, load on that building. So I prefer to modulate the temperature as opposed to modulating the circulator speed. So uh, especially if you're using outdoor reset control because they're kind of trying to fight one another. The reset control is trying to tell the boiler one thing and the circulator trying to do the opposite thing to maintain that delta T so they kind of end up at odds with one another. <clears throat> hey, Bob, uh, Steve had a question, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. he, he was wondering if that example was using copper fin or cast iron baseboard. 
on the previous one. This this was a fin tube that we modeled this with. Again, Siggy did the model on it, but there's 50 feet of three quarter baseboard. That uh, and there's the output of the baseboard, um, and that's where we uh, didn't the math didn't come out exactly right, but that's where we tried to constrain, and that's what this is shown in this graph is a piece of a uh, three quarter fin tube. Yeah, you is it a copper or uh, yeah, cast iron? Copper, copper fin copper. tube. Okay. Yeah, I mean, steel, 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 steel copper. Kind of, okay. Yeah, the baseboard you could um, you could model that too, or the slab, which I'm getting to next. I'm I'm going to do a panel radiator, a fin tube, and a uh, uh, a radiant concrete slab. I didn't do a cast iron radiator. <clears throat> and uh, Ted asked if um, this also calculates the drop off in heat delivery as the flow becomes laminar. Yeah, so that that's exactly right. Somebody's following this exactly the what I'm trying to show out. So you're going to get down to a point here. Remember, I showed you earlier that on that three quarter it was PEX tubing on that uh, PPI calculator. I showed you when I got down to this flow rate was at 0.4. I think it was in that three quarter PEX, which has a little smaller ID than three quarter copper, of course. But I think it was at 0.4, and that's why this would just it would be in the toilet quickly here if you got down below that uh, 0.4 GPM where you want to laminar flow. Now the the water's just going straight through that tubing, and you're not getting and not getting very good transfer at all. So that, yeah, that's exactly what uh, what's going on there. So what we want to do now is we want to look at one of my favorite ways to heat a building. It was with a radiant slab. So um, we talked about how many BTUs per square foot is possible in a residential slab. So really the limitation on that is the surface temperature. You know, you don't want to get the surface temperature here too warm that people in bare feet would be uncomfortable walking on it. I tend to think, you know, in the mid 70s to high 70s is about right. You know, everybody's skin temperature can vary a little bit, but usually below 85 degrees, below 84 degrees is probably the sweet spot. Some people say down around 75 to 78. And so if you would look at that, if you're limited by that surface temperature, that's <clears throat> going to limit how much heat I can get out of a square foot of a, a concrete slab, for example. So uh, it, let's use an 82 degree surface temperature. And let's say the ambient temperature in that room or in that building is 68 degrees, 82 minus 68. The factor is 1.9 for a bare uh, concrete slab without any finish on it. I'm going to get about 26 BTUs per square foot. So when you hear people say, well, the most I can get out of a concrete slab is a uh, 28 or 30 degrees uh, uh, BTUs per square foot. That's where that number's coming from. Now, if I was in a shop building where people in, uh, you know, work boots or something all the time, I could raise that surface temperature up a little bit higher and get a little bit more output out of that slab. Again, if I'm at a, a residential application where I know people, you know, might be walking around barefoot or something like that, they certainly don't want to have to put shoes on because the floor temperature is too hot. So that's really the driving factor on what kind of a, you know, heat output you can get per square foot of a slab. Now, obviously, as you start putting floor coverings on that, you're putting R value on there, you're limiting that output. So, and here's a, let's take that number and just do a, a little snow melt here. And so let's say we're supplying 105 degree supply temperature to a slab that's a, in a 30 degree temperature, 30 degree ambient. Well, 105 minus 30 times 1.9, that's where we get such a massive uh, output on a radiant slab that's outside as a snow melt instead of inside. I've got this big delta T that I'm leveraging from my uh, supply water temperature to my ambient temperature. So that's how you say, well, how can a, a square foot of concrete give you so much different output? Well, that's the condition right there. I'm going to send you to my friend's website. I call him the Thermal King, uh, Robert Bean. There's so much information on his website about the, all these different studies that have been done over the years about floor temperature and humidity. I mean, it really is a comfort site more than it is a heating site over there. And this is just one of the graphs that uh, I got permission to use. And he's shown this design temperature here in this range. Uh, in fact, I think this article, one of these standards over here, ASHRAE standard 55, um, suggests 75 degrees being a, an optimum temperature. I tend to think, for me anyways, that's a little um, on the cool side. If I stepped on a 75 degree uh, slab, well, it might be covering the heat load. It might not feel warm to your uh, customer's feet. So if they're expecting a warm slab all the time, that's probably getting a little bit low. So usually somewhere around that 82 degree seems to be about right for me, surface temperature. And so that's uh, that's going to dictate the output of this um, slab. Again, is the, the maximum temperature I can get on the surface of that. Now, know that I showed you on this one and that uh, that other FEA I showed you a little bit earlier. That's going to vary across the you know the surface area of the slab depending on the spacing of the tube. So if you've got 12 inch 
on center spacing, you know, that high temperature is going to be right over the tube where it is, and it's going to get a little cooler between the tube until you get to the next one. So that's another little thing to do if you want a really nice, consistent floor temperature is get that spacing tighter. Get it down to a 9-inch, even a 6-inch if you can do it, um, because that's going to even out that surface temperature, and it's going to allow you to run that slab at a lower uh, supply water temperature to get that amount of output, because now I've got the whole entire slab um, at a consistent temperature instead of having that what we call striping where you got warm over the tube uh, cool spaces in between it in fact of all the tubing that i've used over the years to do radiant uh, slabs the most uh comfortable one i found was uh well it was first called a solar roll and then heatway came out with that uh, twin tran and it was a tube right next to a tube they're actually connected and it was a counter flow so you had hot going one way and the opposite on the other way and it really I mean, you could take your hand over the surface of that concrete and you could barely tell a temperature difference between tube and tube because that counter flow design and that tighter spacing in that tube, it really uh, evened out the uh, the um, surface temperature. Um, so yeah, I mean, visit there if you have a chance. And Robert's always doing interesting things. He's got a new book out. He just did a study in uh, collaboration with the BC Housing Institute, the education grants program back there. And so, uh, uh, support his site and, and download this and you can read it. It's a, it's a lot of information there. Some of it's, I'm punching a little bit above my weight on some of that stuff that he puts in there, but um, it's good information about other things you want to think about for comfort, not just the temperature of the room. Excuse me. <clears throat> All right. How am I doing for time? Yeah. All right. So here it is on a slab. And so what's interesting about this is Let's call this a, what we modeled here is a 300 foot loop of half inch PEX tubing and a four inch bare slab, a 12 inch on center. And what I'm gonna do in all these instances here is I'm gonna give them the exact same supply temperature. I'm gonna keep that temperature consistent and I'm gonna uh, change the flow rate and look what that does to the delta T going across here. So on this one here, we're running this at a 25 degree delta T, so 110 coming out at 84. And you can see exactly by the color of that loop what happens. So if you get down to this part of the room or this end of the loop, that's not gonna be a variable, uh, very comfortable uh, floor surface temperature there because I've run in such a wide uh, temperature differential there. So all right, let's take and squeeze it down. Same temperature here. I'm gonna squeeze it down to um, a 12 degree delta T and you can see I'm starting to even that out a little bit better. I can go all the way down to a 7.3 and now you can see I've got a pretty consistent temperature from the, the front end uh, to the back end of it. Now keep in mind, it's gonna cost you more pumping power to do this and that's gonna be the trade off is how much circulator do I wanna throw at this to get this job done. I'm of the opinion as long as you're in a you know low to medium head circulator, that's not too much circulator. If you gotta put two double 11 or 2699s, you know, flange the flange together to get this to happen, that's probably not, you know, a good design to do there. And so there it is right there. I and mean, you can see as my flow rate changes, you can see how the output of that slab. Now notice on the red curve up there, you get to the point where a lot more pump gets just very little bit more um, output. So you can see I got a pretty steep curve going up. And then when I start to get out here, and this is kind of the difference between a one gallon a minute and a four gallon a minute on a fin tube baseboard, you get a little bit more output, but is it worth the extra pump to do that? You know, you just got to run the numbers and know that, but you're going to get to a point where this is going to start to flatten out. Even if I went out here to three, four gallons per minute, not going to get that much more output, but it's going to start gobbling up a lot more um, pump horsepower to get you there. So what about low load radiant application? So what we're finding in a lot of the new homes, especially the ones that are trying to get, you know, green certified or LEED certified, they're getting pretty low BTU per square foot heat load numbers. In fact, we've seen some designs where single digit uh, heat on a design day, single digit uh, BTU per square foot requirements. So how do you get down there? Well, here's what you're gonna run into. You're gonna find that to put that kind of uh, heat energy into a building in a design condition, you're gonna have a pretty low uh, water temperature to be able to do that. And again, right there, 73 degrees surface temperature to get that 10 B2 per square foot load. That's not gonna be a warm floor. If you're selling this to a customer as a warm floor house, they're gonna walk in there and say, my floors actually feel cool, not warm. And you're gonna say, well, what's the temperature? Well, it's 72 degrees in here. Well, the heating system is covering the load, but it's not um, getting the floor warm to have to do that. So uh, there's the math to, to calculate that. If we know what the load is on it, we know what the ambient air temperature, in this case, I'm calling it 68 degrees, to get that 10 BTUs per square foot, I only need a surface temperature of 73 degrees. Now, the good news about that, if I've got a ModCon boiler, I'm probably gonna run that boiler at 80, 85 degree supply temperature. I'm gonna have a great condensing con uh, condition and keep that up in the high 90% efficiencies, but you know, you wanna make sure if the customer's expecting 
expect in warm floors, uh, that's not going to be the case. So this is uh, actually John Sigenthaler's kitchen, and this he did back, I think, in 1979. He understood this heat flood concept, and that was a low load room there because he built a super insulated house. It looks like he's got a little air leakage around his doors. I don't know if it's Siggy's on the uh, on the seminar tonight, but. Um, so what he did here, he said, well, what if I just loaded a band on the outer perimeter, don't put anything in the center of the room, and now my heat flux goes down, and it's going to drive the output of this up to instead of 10 to 20, and now my supply temperatures to get that output are going to be at 83 degrees. So as you can see in the infrared picture right here, you can see in some spots, in fact, right on top of the tube, he's probably about, well, probably about 85 degrees, if 86 is the top end of the white. Down in here is probably in the mid 80 degree uh, temperature across that. And the other thing you can see with the infrared scan is you can see that uh, striping based on the, the spacing of the tube. So that's one way you could do it. You know, I could still have radiant floor. I'm going to have a warm floor when I'm standing in front of these doors and windows here. And I'm going to cover my load, even though I've got a low, um, you know, low B2 per square foot requirement on it. So you could do something like this. You could maybe put some panel radiators in there also uh, would be another way to cover a low load condition. But just know that if I cover this entire room uh, with radiant tube, it's probably going to be running at 70 degrees and it's not going to feel like a, uh, a warm radiant floor to the, uh, to the owner of that building. Same thing with panel radius. So here's a really good look at a panel radiator uh, under operating condition. And notice the delta T on this. I'm running a 40 degree delta T. I'm getting some great output on this because I've got a lot of surface area. I've got all that metal. And some of the panel radiators, I don't remember what brand this is, you know, have uh, fins in them. So I'm getting radiant heat off of this, you know, the wave, uh, the, the, the light uh, infrared, but I'm also uh, getting some convection current. So the cold air is going to come in the bottom, as you can see here, the, the darker colors, the colder temperature is going to come up and you can see a little bit of convection current coming out of the top. So I've actually got kind of a dual emitter here that I'm going to, if I'm standing in front of it, I'm going to feel that that warm metal radiating to me. And I'm also going to get a little convection kind of rolling the air through the room. Uh, just like you would with a fin tube. And you can see the difference here, the delta T shows up on the supply and return tube. And this, you know, the nice thing about these panel radios, a couple of things is number one, I can run them at a wide delta T, which means now if I'm returning this temperature, I'm in a great, again, condition for my a mod con boiler. I can use really small diameter tube because I'm running that wide delta T and I don't need a lot of pumping power. I don't need a lot of flow to be able to uh, run that wide delta T. So my pipe size goes down, my pump size goes down, I get down into my condensing conditions with that low supply temperature you know not quite what i'm going to get with a radiant slab perhaps but that's a pretty uh pretty nice uh, heat emitter you can see why most of europe uh, is heated with panel radiators i could put a trv a thermostatic radiator valve on that and i could have you know room by room or even radiator by radiator adjustability on that um, on that system Nice to have an infrared camera. You can really learn a lot um, just by looking at things, looking at the color and seeing what's going on as opposed to, you know, always running the numbers and, and cranking the output on a graph or a chart. Uh, the color puts a little interest to it. So what about this? What about a system where I could run a 92 degree delta? So look at this system here. I'm using a conventional cast iron boiler in this case. I'm going to run that at 180 degrees. And now out here on my radiant, I only need about 105 degree um, supply temperature so all i need to do is take some small diameter pex tubing because i'm going to run this huge delta t here i could probably feed that manifold with what I don't know, maybe there's 10 loops on that <clears throat> with half inch pex because i'm leveraging this delta t i'm taking 180 degrees out here i'm mixing it with my return water coming back at um, uh, say 88 degree and that's how i'm getting that wide delta t so now there's a system where i'm really leveraging wide delta t i'm using small pipe i'm using small pumps because i'm uh, I'm leveraging that 180 to 88 degree uh, delta T. Now, that being said, you know, I've got a boiler that's not going to uh, condense, obviously, at those kind of operating conditions. So a little give and take here, you know, to be able to run at that 180 degree, I probably wouldn't put a, a mod con boiler under that condition other than, you know, if I wanted the modulation aspect of it, I'd still have that, even though I'm running way out of a, where it's ever going to condense. And that's why in this example here, we've got a return protection valve on this. So to make sure that I've always uh, maintained an 130 degree return to that cast iron boiler so I don't start sweating or condensing in that boiler. So just a basic uh, three-way thermostatic valve will protect that, um, that boiler from running too cold. Uh, yeah, I think I covered all that. All right, the last thing we'll talk about heat exchangers, then we'll do a little video. Uh, yeah, there's different types of heat exchangers. This is what we call a tube and shell, uh, coil and shell, flat plate heat exchangers. 
These are just ways that you can move heat um, from one fluid stream to another. I might use this for uh, making domestic hot water. I might have a snow melt that I want to put glycol in. I want to run the boiler on regular water. I might move a, uh, use a heat exchanger like this. You can move a lot of energy through these little plate heat exchangers over here in these different type of heat exchangers. So uh, sometimes you'll see a coil right in the side of a boiler, a tankless coil, you know, just a, a cage of a copper tube that goes in the side of that. It's just basically a heat exchanger that's using the the boiler fluid on one side and the domestic water goes through the inside of that. And there's an example of a couple that I've got here in my shop. I actually cut one in half one day just to show a visual of how you can get so much heat transfer out of these tiny little heat bricks, we call them. It's all the surface area that you have in there. You can see all these passageways. Number one, you've got a lot of surface area and you've got really turbulent conditions because you can see as the water flows through those passageways, you've got a lot of activity and that's where you can get that, um, that good heat transfer by having a lot of uh, turbulent condition. If you put one of these in, there's a couple ways you can pipe them. You could go supply and return, supply and return on both the A and B side called a parallel flow. You're going to get a little bit better heat transfer if you do a counter flow because, again, you're using that delta T, the cold against the warm. You're getting a better exchange there, and that's just basically what these graphs are showing, the, the difference between the parallel and the, the counter flow and the flat heat exchanger. In fact, this is probably a better, a better example of that. <clears throat> Now there's the math. If you wanted to run the numbers by hand, again, the best way to do this is just go on to one of the manufacturers of these, and they, most of them have free um, software simulation on their uh, on their website that you can just plug in the flow rates, plug in the temperatures, and you can predict this here. But you can see not a huge difference between the parallel flow and the uh, counter flow in this example here, but it just again depends on what you're asking or what condition you're putting that heat exchange under uh, to determine that. And so what I would, um, if you want to a little fuzzy unless I'm hallucinating but that uh, uh, just a screen grab so this is an example of the, the GEA uh, website there so all you need to know is all these different conditions if you know the temperature on the A side and the B side you can predict the amount of uh, uh, heat energy that this uh, little plate heat exchanger can move and and you can play around with this you can change the side of the uh, uh, the temperatures on there you can change the size of the heat exchanger uh, you can play different pressure drops with it if you want to make sure you can do it with a small uh, circulator pump basically you just change the dimension of the plates or the size of the the external dimension of that and you can really uh, you can nail these into an exact number in fact if you size one of these uh, accurately and um, well enough, you can get what's called a, clo a close approach, where I could get pretty close to the same temperature coming out of this as I'm putting in the other side. So if you want to make domestic hot water, it's say um, you want 120 degree domestic hot water coming out of it, and you've got 125 or 130 degree on a solar array, let's say on the other side of it, I could get that uh, heat exchange if I size the, uh, the plates properly, get a you know a big enough size that I could transfer that heat within that. Uh, three to five degree uh, close approach uh, temperature range. So yeah, you can do a lot of things with those. And here's indirect tanks, just a heat exchanger if you think about it. So this is what's called a reverse indirect where the boiler water would be in the tank and then the coils, the copper coils are sometimes stainless is where the domestic water. So it's almost like an instantaneous tankless heater and that the water gets heated as it goes through these loops inside there and it comes out at the temperature. So uh, and those can be nice buffer tanks also. You can use that as both your uh, your indirect heat source as well as your buffer tank for maybe a microzone system. And this is a nice way to do it in that you can just buy a blank tank. You could just buy a you know inexpensive electric water heater, just a plain steel insulated tank, and then put the heat exchanger on the outside of it. Now it's going to cost you a circulator pump to do that, but the nice thing about that is you can size that to exactly what the load is. If it's doing a uh, domestic water load or it's doing a radiant heat load, you size the plate heat exchanger and the size of the circulator. So this becomes your thermal storage, your battery, so to speak. And then the plate heat exchanger just pulls out whatever rate of heat uh, and whatever temperature you need out of that. This is, happens to be a chilled water tank that we're doing cooling out of, but the same concept applies there. And this is probably the more standard, more common uh, indirect type where the um, the fluid from the boiler would go through the coil in there and come out and would heat the tank. Now, I've seen these pipe both ways. Some people say, well, wouldn't you want to put the hot water in at the bottom where the coldest water is? Yeah, you could do that. But what uh, the intention here is, is I want to heat the top part of this tank as quickly as possible. So if I've got a, a call for domestic hot water, um, I'm heating the top of the tank first. It's like an electric water heater. You know how the top element always kicks on first, uh, raises the temperature at the top of the tank. So you've got hot water and then it kicks down to the bottom element to to finish it off. So either way, 
All right. So that's the, um, what do you got for questions there, Kevin? Anything or we'll, we can do a little video and uh, we can come back for questions. Uh, well, I've got a really nice comment here from Mark. He said, uh, I have three houses with hydronics. One has all radiant walls, one with walls, floors, and steel panel radiators, and one with radiant ceilings and radiant windows. And he prefers the radiant ceiling overall. Uh, I hadn't heard that before. Yeah, um, I've been, I've been in most, Mark. Yeah, thanks. I've been in one of Mark's house with the windows, and it's a it's a pretty amazing thing. But you know what? I, you know, there's pros and cons to everything. What I like about the um, uh, the radiant ceilings is you've got a lot of surface area up there to play with, so you can get um, you know you got a huge radiator basically with what you have. So um, um, yeah, really interesting. interesting. Floor coverings on it, obviously on the ceiling, so you've got pretty much an encumbered radiator up there. So yeah, thanks for the. Yeah, Indeed. thanks. Thanks, Mark, very much. Uh, I'll, I'll look for some more. Bob, go ahead with your video. Yeah, I'll do a video. And again, this is just kind of a little tool tip thing. It's not really um, a heat transfer related, but I thought maybe somebody could find this useful and use it. So I'll just play this. All right, here's a little tool tip for you. I work with copper pipe quite a bit, both for um, uh, art projects and undoing and redoing different projects in my shop. So I took a block of wood here, just a four by six, and I bored a seven eighths hole through it and a five eighths hole through it. So what that allows me to do is just take and uh, if I want to clamp some pipe in there, mm -hmm. you know, I can work on it, I'm going to drill it or polish it or work on it. And then what I did on the other end here <clears throat> is this is a, uh, a three quarter hole here and this is a one inch hole. And so what that allows me to do is put a fitting in here like this and I can put this in the vise since I'm frugal or cheap. I use the fittings over and over again. Some of these fittings I've used probably a dozen times. And now if I want to get the solder out of there so I can use it again, I just take a five eighths hole saw like this. Clean it out. And there's a perfectly reusable fitting gun. Some of these I've had probably for years that I've just uh, taken apart and used over and over again. So block of wood, a couple hole saws. There you go. All right, everybody clip this out. <laughs> Bob, you're a genius. <laughs> I don't know about genius, but uh, I'm just cheap. I just I hate to throw a copper fitting out, and sometimes I get so much solder globbed in them. You spend an hour with your pocket knife trying to get it get it cleaned yeah. out. So uh, I just came up with that idea. I saw the blocks. I got that online somewhere. That wasn't my idea, but um, it um, I thought it was pretty clever. Jared has a question here. When installing two indirect tanks for thermal storage. Do you feel parallel or serial piping is best, assuming that both tanks are the same size? Yeah, you know, there's pros and cons to both of those. I mean, when we used to do the big custom homes back in uh, in Park City when I worked there, we would put water heaters in series. And basically what you would do is you could just run on one most of the time. And when they had a house full of people and they had, you know, ski guests or something in, they could turn up the uh, the one you know, the first tank was kind of like a preheat tank. It would just let whatever water came in, it would get to ambient room temperature in that tank. And then the second one would be the final feed. So that way it gave the ability to, you know, double them up or have the other. I've seen people parallel pipe them too. You know, it's, um, if you do that, you've got to pipe them properly so that you can, uh, get the webcam back on here, that uh, you get the same amount of flow through, um, through both of them, which takes kind of like, a, what do we call that? Like a moose antler type of, um, a piping to make sure they get the or balance valves to make sure they get the same amount of flow on them. I think he's meaning for the output side and the uh, as far as the boiler side, the same thing. You could uh, you'd probably want to pipe them so they both get the same supply water temperature. But you could, you know, we've done that with solar tanks where you've got the uh, a double coil tank and you let the solar do the bottom of the tank and then you let the um, the upper coil connect to the boiler. That if the solar can't keep up or doesn't get it warm enough, you just kick on to the um, um, you know the upper coil. So. Yeah, and, and here's here's a good one from Howard Hansen, uh, referring back to your uh, hot dog, um, <laughs> aqu Aqualung. Is is that what Ellen said? Yeah, is yeah, that's, that's, where yeah. where do you bleed the air out of the dog? Next. Next one. I don't. That's a good question. I just shove enough flow through it that it just kind of like a uh, you know a geonomy type of heat exchanger. You just kind of drive enough flow through that and blow the air right through it. So it had a pretty small diameter. I think it was three eighths um, um, 
Gasplex or Wardplay, I don't remember what brand I use. So yeah, it blows out pretty quickly because yeah, there's no way to get a, a bleeder in there without coming out his ear or something, I guess. Yeah. Does anybody want to raise their hand and ask a question? We have we have a few minutes here. I'll watch for that. That's about it for the questions though, Bob. Yeah, and I had a couple that were sent in. I think I answered them through the um um I printed those off that were uh, pre-submitted questions. I don't know if you can see those on there, Kevin. But um, I'm trying to think what the one was. It was a question from last week, actually, I think. Yeah, I guess I don't have it here. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, then I guess we'll, uh, we'll call it a wrap. We had a good turnout tonight. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. And uh, <clears throat> That's how you can get a hold of me if you want to chat or if you have uh, questions on something or if you have something you want to teach me. I'm, I'm certainly willing to learn. If you've got some uh, clever tool tips or something like that you want to try out, let me know, and uh, we can certainly do that. And like I say, next week we'll be back on the demo board. I don't know if you can see oh, that. You could show them your gloves. Your I, uh, I'm going to show you some kind of turbulent flow condition over on this. Uh, I don't know if you can see that at all. You can see how the... Uh, the flow is going on there, maybe not. My lighting's not so good in here. Sorry about that, but uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have that demo going again for next week. When I put some food coloring, and the color uh, helps it jump off a little bit better, and you can kind of see that that turbulent flow going through there as I change the pump speed and that play around with the balancing valve. So, can you put that bare concrete output graph up again, just for a second? Uh, um, Jim Jim is Jim wants to take another quick look at that if you still have it. Yeah, and these are, um, I think it was way up at the top, wasn't it? You know, these slides are available. If somebody wants them, we'll, um, you know, at the end, uh, um, you know, just let us know where you want them to send them. We'll probably turn it into a PDF so it's easier to, uh, I think it was at this one. Not exactly a bare slab. It's got a little bit of hardwood on top of it. Yeah, w was that, that it, Jim? Did you want to raise your hand and ask a question about that? Here's a hand. Um, well, let me see if Jim's got his hand raised. Uh, he doesn't, but um, here's a hand raised. Uh, Gabor, is that how you pronounce your name? You're unmuted. Hello. Gaber. Gabor Millisix. Millisix. Sorry, I probably mispronounced your name. Bob, I did find those pre-submitted questions. If uh, oh, okay. uh, if you want to try to answer this, but one of the questions was, how do you size a heat exchanger for a snowmelt application? Yeah, and I think that's one I covered. That's why I put that little graph in there. I'm using that. Um, oh, every brand has a little uh, simulator like that. Sometimes you have to uh, agree to some terms or something to sign up or register to get it. But um, yeah, you can just go in there. If you, you, you need some information, you need to know what the load is on that. You need to know what kind of supply temperature your boiler is going to be able to supply to it. And then you just start plugging in some numbers. And it's uh, usually they spit out a couple different choices, you know, depending on the, what kind of Delta T and stuff you want to run. They usually give you two or three different choices. But uh, you can try the simulator. And most of the people, if you call them or send them an email, some of them have that live chat on the bottom of their website now if you need help. Uh, size and that they'll they'll give you some tips because sometimes they can optimize it for you and, and put you in a price range that works out too so yeah that's what I would suggest I mean you can do the long hand the math is in in fact I think it's in the back of this hydronics there's a little uh, formula for size and uh, plate heat exchanges like I showed you in that one slide but you know I like clicking buttons instead of doing the math I'm not a good math person <laughs> okay and any tips Bob on yearly maintenance that needs to be done on heat emitters that you can oh, that, share yeah, that's the one I thought of so yeah that's a good question I mean it would depend of course on the type of heat emitter not much to do on a radiant slab other than sweep it once in a while but if you have a um a fin tube sometimes especially if you live with pets they can get uh you know dog hair and their you know dust and stuff and can build up on them and you don't get much output you might have to get in there with a little vacuum cleaner with a brush on the end of it the same thing with like a forced uh a convector kind of like when you have to clean out underneath your refrigerator out now and then because all the lint and dust gets plugged up on the uh, on the coils on the underside of your refrigerator so those would probably take more maintenance obviously if you have a you know a, a a coil with a heat exchanger in it with a you know a ducted type of system filter maintenance would be important on that so you get enough uh, airflow across that coil across that heat exchanger to get the performance that you need so 
another reason why I like radiant slabs are pretty pretty low maintenance. Just you know, keep the water flowing through them, and they work. Hey Bob, would this slab output mathematic uh, calculation work the same for radiant cooling, or is it different? Um, it would be a little bit different. In fact, it changes a little bit for radiant walls and radiant ceiling on this multiplier because what happens on a radiant ceiling, even though you've got more surface area and you can usually run them a little low temperature, it does stratify a little bit up there. I mean, there is a little bit of air movement. So uh, this number goes down, I think it's 1.7 on the uh, radiant ceiling that you'd use for a multiplier. But you know, we're gonna have a, a radiant cooling webinar, Coffee with Cleffy at the end of the month. In fact, my son Max, who I guess is tuned in here, is gonna be doing that. And he's, I'm never done one, to be honest with you. I'm certainly not an expert in that area, but I know that's a, an interesting topic now, especially with all the new heat pump technology coming out that we can heat and cool from a, you know, one source that um, people are gonna start, uh, you know, considering radiant cooling. Yeah, thanks. So, Greg, uh, tune into our Coffee with Kalefi webinar on Thursday, the 21st at 12 yeah. o'clock Central Time, and that's when Max will be talking about radiant cooling. Yeah. Thanks. Nice. All right. Got anything else, or? Let's see, uh, when will we? When will you be doing the hydro separator? Um, Next Monday. Yeah. Yeah, next Monday. I think. Let me look at my. Yeah, next Monday. The uh, what is today? The fourth is. Is today the fourth? Mm -hmm. The eleventh. With you is today. May the fourth. <laughs> yep. So the so Steve, that will be on the eleventh next Monday night. Bob will talk about hydroceps. Yeah, same bat time, same uh, bat station. But yeah, that's going to be interesting. I got some uh, some really. Uh, interesting things to show you about hydraulic separation. We kind of pioneered that. I'd like to think Cluffy in the US because we brought that product over from Europe where it was developed for, you know, specifically for high pressure drop boilers is kind of where that started. So, uh, and of course got a little bit of a Gil Carlson spin on it too, because it basically is a primary secondary piping arrangement in the box. So, <clears throat> yeah, all right. Oh, did you guys see my uh, silverback? I was, my wife said to show you that. I use that when I'm working on things here. These They make these little gloves with magnets in it so you can keep a, uh, I use those when I used to do a lot of uh, overhead uh, heat transfer plates because all the screws, you keep dropping them. So you put your screws on there and you've got them right up by your hand. So that's my silverback. <laughs> all right. Anybody? Well, I think that's it, Bob. And uh, you'll remind everybody, we'll, you know, the, these questions will get back to you. Um, that's that's all I have here, Bob. All yeah, right. And just Let's importantly, um, if you want to donate to Meals on Wheels, there will be a survey at the end of the webinar. Just um, plunk in your amount, and Kalefi will match up to five hundred dollars. So yeah. we just yeah. wanted to have a concerted effort in helping our elderly population. We know they've been hit hard by this crazy COVID thing. So uh, and be sure to tune in next week. More fun. Well, hey guys, real quick, uh, someone asked, what's the date again for Max's uh, coffee with Kalefi? Was it Max who asked? No, someone asked. <laughs> Thursday, no, the, Thursday the 21st. That wasn't funny, that Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's always, uh, we try and do them the last Thursday of the month, and that's noon central time, too, so you know the, the time thing. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, we, we should get you invites out for stuff like that if you're in our database, right, Mary? Don't you send them out to yep. pretty much everybody. Yep, it's coming out tomorrow for our general audience, so Thursday, May 21st playing it cool with radiant so uh, max has got a, a wonderful presentation and line uh lined up for our audience so you got to join us for that one for sure yeah that'll be fun yay during working hours too <laughs> huh. well thanks mary for that nice wrap up and kevin and john and tim and the mechanical hub people for sponsoring this and making this available to everybody it's been um, been fun so far so i hope everybody else is enjoying it and i uh, will keep doing it and um, everybody stay safe and healthy out there and hope to see you in person again someday soon. So thanks everybody. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. All right. Good night. <laughs>